Okay, so due to a technical problem, we cannot go live, it seems, but uh, well, welcome to the recorded version of the ICOR webinar number four. Um, welcome to the ICOR webinar series. This is number four, like I said. Uh, good morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are in the world, uh, or when you're watching this film. This is Claudio speaking. I am just going to quickly, very quickly tell you who is going to talk today. And then without much further ado, we start the, uh, the webinar. So today we have, well, first of all, from the Technical University of Munich, our moderators. So Dr. Cristina Piazza and Dr. Patricia Capsi Morales. Then uh, Maria Fossati from Genoa. Maria is a technician, a long time technician at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa and a user of upper limb prosthetic devices. Then we have Roland Auberga of um, Otto Bock um, from Austria, actually. Uh, well, Robert Reina, possibly the Cybathlon is his brainchild. Is one of the big creators of the Cybathlon from the um, um, Technical High School of Zurich, the ETHZ. And last but absolutely not least, my colleague Jörn, Jörn Vogel from the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics of the DLR, located in the unpronounceable village called Oberpfaffenhofen. So without much further ado, I give the floor to Patricia and Christina, who will introduce the speakers and the first speaker in particular. Thank you very much, Claudio. So yes, let me first share a few slides. I just want to um, briefly introduce a bit the this idea of the webinar uh, and why are we doing a specific webinar for ICOR dedicated to the Cybathlon event. So as you all know, when we develop multiple uh, technologies uh, during our research, um, we usually face the problem of how to evaluate them. And uh, often we evaluate them with typical standard assessments that of course can have like a lot of variability in, in the selection of the assessment, but also we lack in literature comparisons between technologies. So we often face the problem to not fully understand what is the main uh, problems with the solution that we propose. And of course, users are mostly involved at the end of the process or by uh, in the testing part and not in the design process. And uh, even the use of these uh, technologies are tested only in very simplistic uh, environments. So um, we came with the idea that actually Cyberlon, uh, which will be later introduced, it's a good opportunity for benchmarking our technologies. And actually this is something that we did some uh, time ago uh, together with Christina and also uh, former professor Antonio Bicchi and professor Liselot Hermanson, which actually, who actually participated in the previous ICOR webinar. And for that, we tried to uh, collect all the videos and, and, and information from the prosthesis users that participated in the previous two events of Cybathlon in order to collect a big amount of state-of-the-art systems, both from the market and from more research-oriented solutions that were tested under the same circumstances, same conditions, etc. But we now not only check the time scoring uh, that we can get from Cybathlon, but actually even include an additional standard assessment, which was the ICMC, um, that is based on the evaluation of the usage of the system in uh, in activities that are inspired by activities of daily living. So this Cybathlon actually proposed a very well uh, solution for that. And our question was not only to evaluate if Cybathlon could be this benchmark benchmarking opportunity, but also which trends were visible in this state-of-the-art hands that can propose uh, more beneficial or satisfactory, satisfactory use of uh, artificial limbs at home. And just to briefly mention some of the results, we observed that there was a clear distinguish, uh, distinction between market or more advanced solutions compared to research or excessively simple uh, solutions that were participating. So actually the ACMC was very sensitive at the um, re at the readiness level of the of the technology, but not only that, we can also now evaluate all the different technologies and the different um, points in which we can assess each of the technologies and see which are the main spaces or 
empty parts in which our technology is not reaching the adequate level of capacity. So we realized, for example, readjusting was still very limited or most of the people still um, uh, has to look at the prosthesis for doing most of the actions. So we believe that these cyberthlon uh, events can actually uh, push the boundaries of our technologies, not only specifically, specifically each of the labs, but actually work for research as a bench marketing solution to to compare these uh, these trends and help in designing better solutions in the future. So now we start with the um, first talk. So as Claudio mentioned, we have a very good selection of speakers. So we are very happy to uh, have you all here. And uh, the idea, as Patricia also mentioned, is to understand from the developer's perspective and the user, user needs how Cybertron pushed the boundaries of technologies and science for assistive technologies. So we have representatives from different disciplines, but also we start with our first speaker, which is Robert Riner. Uh, Robert is full professor for sensory motor system at the Department of Health and Science and Technology at ATH Zurich, and he also holds a double professorship uh, with the University of Zurich. Uh, as all of you know, uh, Robert is the initiator and organizer, organizer of Cybatron, uh, which soon will uh, uh, take his third edition. And for this was honored with several awards, including the European Excellent Award and the Yahoo Sport Technology Award. So uh, Robert, we are looking forward to your talk and thanks again for your participation. Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to say some more details about the Cyberthon, which takes place now in October this year. And uh, I will also say something about the historical development of the Cyberthon. So I think most of you know that I'm not only uh, uh, or not primarily an event organizer. I'm a researcher at ETH Zurich and University Hospital Bargrist in Zurich as well. And in this function, um, we develop in our lab different kind of devices and uh, to evaluate them on patients and people with impairments. So we have uh, developed a different kind of therapy devices for upper and lower extremity training, but also assistive devices such as prosthesis, uh, wheelchairs, um, one of the wheelchairs which took place, um, took part at the Paralympics in Paris was co-developed by our lab. Um, and uh, also exoskeletons or orthotic devices. And um, it was already now almost 14 years ago that I've seen the newspaper article about this guy walking up the Willis Tower in Chicago. You see, this news comes from November 2012. And when I saw this, I, I got a bit jealous and thought, um, why are always Americans having the good ideas, selling their high tech and research in this way? then I thought, why not organizing another event where we showcase our assistive technologies, which we developed in Switzerland, but also in other countries, by an event in Switzerland. So I, I thought about a race um, with uh, processes walking up a famous mountain in Switzerland, but then it might uh, be, have bad weather conditions. And then I thought, well, let's go into a stadium build up a certain racetrack like this one, where we can not only showcase prosthetic developments, but also exoskeletons and wheelchairs, walking up or rolling up stairs, going over certain kind of pillars, over water, going on a narrow bar, walking slalom and so on. And then I thought about further disciplines, also upper extremity prosthetics, brain computer interfaces and functional electrical stimulated bike races. So uh, this was, that year came 2013. Uh, I was first alone, but then I included my lab to uh, help me developing something. And thanks to many people, we ended up with this kind of race track. For most of the races, we had four pilots. We still have four pilots competing against each other. For example, for the exoskeleton race, you see here a chair to sit down and set up. Um, then some kind of narrow path, a uh, slope, a door, um, and, and, and steps finally. And this was then um, being tested because we did not have any experience and we wanted to do the races in a huge stadium. So we did rent the stadium one year in advance to the main event, 2015, and organized the rehearsal without real audience, but with television uh, there to produce some media coverage and invited about 30 teams to show the technology and try out this, uh, and test the 
competition. That worked very well. And a year later, we had the first Sabathon in the same stadium, sold out stadium in this ice hockey stadium in Kloten next to Zurich. That's where the airport is. And then we had these six races, which we designed in more detail. So we had um, exoskeletal race, then a lower prosthetics race. The prosthesis do not need to be powered, but maybe with the powered prosthesis, it might be easier to walk up a ramp and walk stairs. Then there was an arm prosthetic race where the pilots had to do certain tasks which are relevant in daily life, such as um, cooking or preparing a breakfast, uh, cutting bread, putting butter onto the bread. Then we had a powered wheelchair race. Here the device needed to be powered to be able to walk up or, or drive upstairs and ramps. Then we had a FES bike race and a brain computer interface race where we have provided a game developed with a game or, or um, arts school in Zurich. And um, the, the pilots were invited to come with their software and with their hardware and with their pilot, which could be trained to uh, use any kind of commands and ca any way, any kinds of thinkings to drive her or his avatar in a game. There were three separate commands uh, were possible to deliver to our game uh, in order to perform a racetrack um, successfully and win a race against the three other competitors. Uh, at that uh, Cyberdon, we had 66 pilots. Actually, there were 70 pilots coming, but none of, not all of them were qualified for the races. They were from 25 different countries. We had the sold-out stadium, amazing atmosphere. It's really worth coming to the stadium, even if you're not uh, if you're not a team member. The atmosphere is amazing. It's really fun to watch these races. We had uh, live television, eight hours live in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. And there was a lot of coverage for documentaries at CNN, BBC World News, NHK in Japan, and many other stations. We were uh, full paper, full page um, reports on famous newspapers. And I'm also very proud as a researcher that we could publish this innovation and the innovative technologies in special journals as letters in nature and science and as original papers in several well-known rehabilitation journals. Three special issues did come out after one year after the Cyberthon with many papers show, presenting the new technologies. In the meantime, we have many more papers. I think there are about hundreds of papers uh, which have a link to the topic of the Cyberthon. And there's at least one more special issue which came out last year. That was a picture, the most striking picture of the year from BBC in the year 2016. There's even a stamp which came out about the Cybathlon. We got several awards. And the next Cybathlon did take place 2020. Of course, it was a problem. There was a pandemic. We could not book a stadium and uh, make the races there with the audience. But we have created several hubs, 32 different hubs in 20 countries all over the world. Special thanks goes here to the um, Cyberton CEO, who became CEO in 2020, Roland uh, Siegrist and Annie Kern, who organized here a transmission system of software system, a platform, which allows to broadcast um, live and also offline footage into one center uh, so that different pilots with the teams could record the races and we could then present everything and broadcast everything in a live manner to the teams and to the world. Nobody knew the results. It was still exciting. So we had here one big building of ETH, which served as the global control center, where also the Swiss races did take place. Then we had here dozens of um, cutters and, 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 and footage and TV experts and hundreds of screens to merge all the pictures together and then organize these races on the internet. Here you see some uh, the setting and other the cables we needed was a lot of preparation and a lot of work. That's, for example, one team from Korea who was watching their race, not knowing the outcome, and it was very exciting. There were surprises. And afterwards, we did interviews with uh, the teams and the, and the organizers. And in the meantime, we are three times in the Guinness World Records book. And now, if, what, what you should also know is Cyberthon is not only this big event in the stadium. It's um, 
it's a platform for different kind of events, including also challenges. These are kind of rehearsals where we're trying out different kind of new race formats and technologies, inviting pilots and their teams. We are going to schools, presenting this idea with hands-on demos, with um, uh, devices where the students can build up something, where they speak about ethics and where they calculate things in, in mathematics and physics. We also uh, organized Cyberlon Symposia. Um, we have organized many kind of different kind of Cyberlon experiences, which includes hands-on demos at city festivals, at fairs, uh, discussion rounds, podium discussions at conferences, and so on, and, uh, and many more. The idea is here not only to promote the development of technologies, but also to produce awareness about disability, to do something for inclusion of people without and with this uh, with disabilities and without disabilities. Um, now the new event will come in a, a bit more than a month um, again in the same stadium. We have now two more disciplines uh, created um, besides the six ones presented before. We have now a race uh, assistance ro robot race and a vision assistance race. In the vision assistance race, people who are completely blind can get supported by any kind of assistive systems, including cameras, for example, and display devices such as speakers and or tactile devices to get information about the environment, about the surroundings, about the color of objects which you should grasp or find and grasp and so on. Then we have assistance robot race for people with severe motor impairments where uh, and these pilots have a great challenge to, to do. They have to control their own motorized wheelchair and a robotic device which is maybe mounted onto the wheelchair or walking or rolling next to them in order to help them in daily living tasks such as eating, cosmetic tasks, cleaning up, um, putting uh, dishes into a dishwasher and so on. Now for this event uh, next month we have um, eight hubs. One of the hubs is the main hub that's a Tiri Cup. Then there are seven more hubs from Canada the States, South Africa, Thailand, Hungary, and Korea. And some of the teams will join from their local hubs where we have the experience from the event 2020. But most teams are in the stadium. So we have uh, more than 70 teams in the stadium joining from many different countries all over the world. Many are from Italy, Switzerland, but also France as well, and Germany is well represented. And the daily time, uh, the, 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 the um, event on the three days actually of the Cybertron you see here. So if you're interested to join by internet or coming live, you see here the time uh, schedule. It starts on Friday, 25 of October in the morning at 11 o'clock with the first qualification races in five disciplines. In the afternoon, it will go on with the qualification races. That's actually after uh, six o'clock in the evening. Then the next day, Saturday, October 26, we have further qualifications and finals already. In the evening, we also have qualifications. On, and on Sunday, 27th of October, there will be further qualifications and the final finals until 4 o'clock. There's around, uh, additional, some uh, additional uh, announcements and talks and uh, media coverage in between the breaks. And I hope to see many of you there. And if you still want to come to Zurich and to watch the devices, you can still purchase tickets with this link, for example, or just watch the Sabatlon homepage. And then I hope to see you in October in Zurich, Kloten. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Robert, for your introduction to Sabatlon. Um, I think it was very inspiring to see also the new disciplines that uh, we will see in the next uh, next version, but also to see all the work, the technical work that is behind the event. So we usually see only mostly the participation technologies and stuff, but actually see all the, the work that is done from the organizer's point of view. It's very important also for us. Um, so now we will move to the next speaker, which actually will continue with this process because he will actually present uh, more details on one of the new disciplines. Um, he is John uh, Bogle. He received uh, the Diploma of Engineering degree in Computational Engineering from the University of Paderborn in Germany. And in 2009, he joined the German Aerospace Center uh, DLR 
specifically the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics as a researcher scientist, where he's actually leading the Renewing Robotics Groups. Uh, and he is the head of the application for terrestrial assisted robotics at the DLR. And among the different research interests that he has, this includes assistive robotic manipulation for people with physical disabilities, which he will speak a bit more uh, right now, share control, and also bring computer interfaces. So please welcome Jorn. Yes, thank you, Patricia. Thanks for having me today. Uh, let me quickly start sharing my slides. Um, so, yeah, as said, uh, I will present our work on assistive mobile manipulation for people with physical disabilities. Uh, I'm Jörn Vogel from the German Aerospace Center. Um, let me quickly give you an introduction on the German Aerospace Center. It's a German research um, or governmental research organization with uh, roughly 10,000 employees distributed all over Germany on multiple sites. And uh, the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics is uh, in Oberpfaffenhofen, close to Munich in the south, um, yeah, in the south of Germany. And uh, at the Institutes of Robotics and Mechatronics, we uh, research on different uh, aspects of robotics, some of them related to space, as we are as a German Aerospace Center, uh, but we basically also have matching application domains in terrestrial applications. Um, and today I want to give you um, yeah, um, a perspective of what we do in the terrestrial assistance um, robotics domain and specifically what we do for um, in assistive robotics for people with physical disabilities. Um, the system I will talk about or the system we will also compete with at the Cybertron in the um, assistance robot race is uh, Eden. It's called the EMG controlled daily assistant, which we started developing here in DLR in 2016. Uh, but actually, the work on, on this um, goes back uh, a bit more, basically, since I, when I started in the line 2009. I will get to back, uh, back to that shortly. But let me give you a brief overview of our robotic system. So it's a wheelchair with, uh, with robot arm. And um, on this uh, system, we um, research on basically all aspects of robotics, starting from the hardware, where we integrated the arm uh, with the wheelchair. We actually put an additional access to the arm to increase reachability also uh, to the floor. Uh, we equipped the wheelchair with some uh, wheel encoders to um, be able to uh, measure the automatry of the wheelchair to, to have a, a mobile uh, robotic system where we can control all degrees of freedom. Um, we then, of course, uh, take care of, of the control um, using the DLR lightweight robot uh, in torque control mode uh, and controlling it together with the platform. Um, we in uh, research on, on interfaces, so how can people with severe physical disabilities operate such a system, especially if they are not able to control the system with a joystick anymore. I will also give some examples of that. Um, and then on the other side, we, we have more of the um, high-level software topics where we, we have um, perception of the environment and world modeling to know what objects are uh, available to the robot and what tasks can we do with those. And we then try to provide autonomy um, or autonomous capabilities uh, to the user of the system so that they not only can control the system in direct control, but also in, in a shared control mode or even in a supervised autonomy where the robot uh, autonomously can uh, execute a task without the user needing to give uh, any commands at all. And uh, finally, uh, another research topic, but that is uh, actually not something that, that uh, applies to the Cybertron, uh, is remote teleoperation of such systems, which we investigate uh, in order to provide uh, support from, from uh, remote. So you can envision to have a call center where the user can call for help, and then a teleoperator can actually um, provide support with remote teleoperation. But since uh, that is not the goal of the Cybertron, I will not go into more details on, on this part today. Uh, if you look at uh, how people can control uh, such an assistive device, the most obvious uh, way is, of course, to, to use a joystick and uh, to then take the degrees of freedom of the joystick to um, control the robotic manipulator in translation or then switch to control of the rotation or switch to control of opening and closing the hand, uh, given that, that you have a 3D um, interface that allows you to control all degrees in translation and rotation simultaneously. Otherwise, you would need more states to trigger between. And this is something uh, we did, um, um, yeah, or basically I worked on um, early on, a set uh, alternative interfaces uh, to a joystick, but uh, 3D control. 
uh, as you can see here in the uh, BrainGate experiment that um, I worked on in the early days uh, in DLR. So this is a video from 2011. It's quite a time ago, but the topic of, of invasive brain interfaces is um, very um, much up to date, given all the work that's going on there with Neuralink and other companies trying to commercialize those uh, ideas now. Here we have a work uh, together with the Brown University where a participant with um, um, who is paralyzed from the neck down, controls the robot arm by thinking of moving her um, right uh, hand and arm in the specific directions. And in, in this experiment, she was able to um, basically grab the bottle from the table, bring it to her mouth and, and drink from it. And um, this is work we have done uh, in the US um, back then because um, the Brown University who developed the, the interface um, you know, had um, the participants there and such interfaces were not um, allowed in Europe back in those days, uh, but now there's, as I said, much more research going on in this brain-machine interface direction. Uh, we at DLR then um, try to um, also check how can we um, have non-invasive uh, interfaces when you cannot use a joystick. And we here have a participant with spinal muscular atrophy who has uh, EMG sensors under these red tapes that you can see here. Uh, where there is residual muscle, muscular activation uh, to be recorded. And here, again, in a direct control mode, uh, the user has 3D control of the translation of the arm and can trigger a grasp action of the hand uh, to bring the, uh, the arm towards the bottle and, and uh, um, grasp this. And as you can see, this, uh, it does work, uh, but it also requires a lot of concentration. And uh, she has to be very precise to, to bring the bottle between the fingers um, so um, that's what, what led us to the next step of, of advancing this work and uh, try to um, add shared control to support in those um, activities of, of daily living. So if we take this uh, control scheme of having a user interface and some uh, real-time processes to control the, the robot with, uh, with the user input, uh, basically what we do is we, we take the user input and um, apply um, or feed this into an autonomy module that creates uh, or that demands the user commands to um, yeah, give support or to um, control the, the robot in a, a more efficient way. Uh, of course, this needs information from the surrounding world, so we need a world model um, to fill this. The way we do this is that we uh, model tasks like picking a bottle um, as a, a sequence of, of states in which different so-called input mappings and active constraints uh, are acting. Um, input mapping basically describes how we take the degrees of freedom of the user interface, three in, in this case, uh, and map them to um, degrees of freedom in the task space. And those can be on the robot end effector or on the object the robot is holding. So for instance, if you want to pour into a mug and uh, the lid of the bottle is already over the mug, you may want to assign the X and Y degrees of freedom to rotate uh, the bottle around the tip, whereas the Z component can be assigned to uh, moving up and down um, with the bottle to uh, adjust for the height from, from where you want to pour. Um, additionally, to provide support, we also have these active constraints, which can be, for instance, uh, defining the rotation of the bottle um, relative to the distance uh, towards the mug in a, in a phase where you're further away from the object, or having like a cone constraint to guide you towards the grasp frame um, that you need. And uh, with this, we can basically um, provide support in activities of daily living, so the user only has to give commands roughly into the direction of the object they want to interact with to, uh, for instance, grasp the bottle, or as uh, in the pouring example, when you move then with the bottle towards the mug, in, the, in one state, the um, bottle gets tilted from this constraint that I described, and uh, then in the next state, uh, the input mapping now allows for control around the tip of the bottle to precisely um, control the, the pouring amount and to, to select how much to rotate the bottle. And uh, with this concept, um, we can uh, do activities of daily living. And we um, extended this a bit to also include the degrees of freedom of the wheelchair um, into the, this control scheme. So you can see here some um, whole body demonstration where we move the wheelchair and the arm stays static. Um, but the way we actually um, apply this is by coordinating motion of the wheelchair and the arm in tasks that require a large range of motion, for instance, uh, when you want to go through a door or when you want to open a fridge, where basically as soon as you start pulling on the door, the wheelchair would be in the way. So you have to um, drive backwards a bit and 
in, in this uh, case, or with, with this approach, the user does not have to concentrate on or decide whether to switch with wheelchair driving or arm control, uh, but they can fully concentrate on performing the task with the hand and all the degrees of freedom of the robot are automatically coordinated. And this is basically the technology we are also applying in, this, um, in our um, participation of, of the Cybertron. Um, let me quickly also uh, complete this. So we, we have this world model, which we fill with, um, with the objects uh, detected, but um, I will not go into details here. Let's rather uh, jump forward to our first participants in the Cyberlon challenges in uh, 2023, uh, where the first task was to pick an apple. And uh, as you can see here, basically our pilot, Matthias, is using a 3D joystick uh, and she just has to drive the hand close to the apple and all the orientation and the grasping is uh, coming from the shared control um, support. And similar on the second task where you have to empty um, the shelf, we basically, we have a camera here on the site that localizes the objects and also identifies the objects because we need different strategies for those different kinds of objects. And uh, then knowing which objects uh, Matthias has to retrieve, he just drives the manipulator close to the object and the strategy that needs to be executed to get a secure grasp on the object is then uh, over uh, superimposed on his commands um, from our shared control um, approach. And uh, with this, uh, I want to talk a bit about um, my ideas or my perspective on, on Cybertron. Um, I mean, we, I'm working on this topic of, of assistive uh, robotics for people with uh, motor impairments now since 2009, starting with this interface um, part, but then also building that system uh, in 2016 when there was the first Cybertron, uh, but there was no discipline for this. So I was very happy when I saw that uh, in the upcoming Cybertron, um, there will be uh, this um, assistance robot race, which exactly matches what, what uh, the research we are doing. And um, from my perspective, it's it's very, uh, yeah, this, this, this goal of, of having, getting out of the lab and uh, having this as a, as a benchmark uh, with realistic tasks and, um, but also with, um, with this competitive character, this is very interesting. Uh, because um, what we what we try to do so far is we we try to evaluate our system with uh, with um, real users that are uh, that could benefit from such systems. Um, but I think what is nice about the Cyberdon is that you not only have a benchmark where you have individual tasks that you do once, but you actually have to do them all uh, all together in a sequence. Uh, so many robotic demonstrations are like you do one task and then probably you stop. You reinitialize something, and then you do the next task. Here, you have to do all of the tasks in a sequence. So this, this is a very interesting um, challenge, and uh, it, it um, definitely requires some, um, yeah, some some very robust systems. Uh, and we definitely hope that from from the effort, it is a lot of effort to participate, of course, but it's also very rewarding uh, seeing the the pilot, um, yeah, learning and improving in the use of the system, uh, but also getting the system to a state where uh, actually uh, we hope that we can do better user studies and more um, yeah, more user studies, actually using the Cybertron task as a benchmark in, uh, in studies with our users to investigate the usability of our system. Um, and I'm yeah, very much looking forward to the, uh, to the full event in the um, challenges in 23. We, we um, participated from a, in a local hub in our lab uh, this time we will go to Zurich, and um, yeah, I can't wait to to see the atmosphere there. As Robert said, the, the uh, stadium, I, I hope, I assume it will be sold out again. Uh, this will be an, an intense and uh, interesting atmosphere, and also the exchange with the other teams, learning how they approach this, and building a community around this with a new discipline. I, I think this really advances research in, in this topic. And with that, um, yeah, I want to thank you for the attention. Uh, this is a team uh, working on this in, in DLR and our pilot, Matthias. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing many of you in Zurich and the Cyberdon. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jorn. Very interesting to see also the perspective of the new discipline and all the work behind that lead you to the actual participation to Cyberdon. So now we move to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Maria Fossati. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Maria, which I, I know and I collaborate with since uh, now 10 years, uh, even more. 
So Maria works at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova as a technician, and she was uh, uh, one of the main, let's say, element of the Soft 10 Pro team and the participation uh, um, to the last Cybertron edition for the upper limb prosthesis. And uh, she works uh, um, in IIT on aspects related to user-centered design, prosthetics finishing, embodiment and social acceptance, but also she acts as a tester for the Soft and Pro development. And other research interests of uh, Maria are user experience, ergonomics, strategic and service design, and dealing with issues related to design and disability, disability futures, universal design, accessibility, and perception of technology. So Maria, the floor is yours, and we uh, are very happy to have you on board. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cristina. Uh, well, I try to share my presentation. I hope it works. And uh, well, uh, I would like, you already introduced me. <laughs> you said all the, all the things. But what I would like to share with you actually is uh, that I, I would like to look at uh, prosthesis as a person, not really as a technician. And I would like to present myself with this image, uh, who is uh, Rebecca Horn, who just passed away. And she was a great artist and she made lots of this uh, body extensions, really intending them as uh, relational tools. So uh, you already said I have a PhD in design from Politecnico di Milano and I work in user-centered design here uh, at IIT in uh, Genova. But what I really love is to look also at this really uh, technological devices also has relational tools also from um, a human point of view. So, um, and also we have, uh, yes, we already knew from uh, now our 10 years, of course, and we did lots of uh, adventure, I could say, uh, together uh, with the team, with uh, our team in soft robotics uh, for human cooperation and rehabilitation, which is guided uh, by Antonio Bicchi. We did lots of competition hosted in uh, Deutsche fairs in some showcases around Germany and Switzerland. And then we also uh, had the opportunity to participate it, to participate. I'm sorry, I have some second. Okay, um, at the Cybertron 2020, the global edition. Here, uh, there is our team. So there were also with us uh, Christina and uh, Patricia actually, and we gained it um, the second place in the competition. And yes, at first sight, we can say that Cybertlon uh, for Upper Limb was a competition about prosthesis dexterity. But what I would love to say is that it uh, was also uh, for us a uh, story of humanity and a great team building exercise, we could say. And also from my point of view of a uh, designer, I really intended and I love the Cybertron competition because they really are um, could be intended as a design tool that really uh, had the, the, the strength to embody the user-centered design approach, which is the one that I promote also here in, um, in our team, and that has the capability to involve uh, uh, lots of uh, different uh, people with different backgrounds, uh, such as users, facilitators, and all the technical staff and engineers and researchers and so on. So it uh, really has the, the opportunity to uh, talk about and see in details the user needs and how to transform them from needs, user needs, to design requirements and to push forward the development of our uh, soft and pro prototypes. Uh, another great opportunity of the Cybertron competition in series was to 
trying to push really near the two point of the two main point of view we can say one is from the user point of view and the other one is from designers engineers development team of the uh, device so uh, all the preparation all the training of the cybertron uh, competition has really pushed to be uh, to merge these two different point of view well, but uh, first of all, the the Cybertron was a, a competition, and so uh, he had he gave us the opportunity once again to push the user in doing stuff that that in daily life it might be avoid. So uh, we made lots of time this uh, exercises and pushing the boundaries to to say, okay, what if the key, the blue objects just fall down? Because I have to say one thing that uh, users has uh, really has some habits that just they don't want to leave. So it's really hard to push and to face frustrations and to undermine certain certainties and just try with the team to learn to do uh, things just in another ways. And this was a great opportunity uh, made by the, the, the competition because we have just to do it. And in doing it, we really pushed also forward and ahead the, the development of the of the end and its uh, technology in uh, inside. Well, and there is also uh, this great paper which is pretty old now, that uh, push designers and our team to act as apprentices in <clears throat> observing and working with users. And this is exactly what the Cybertron competition pushed us training and doing and trying to solve this uh, daily life activities. Uh, we really seeing working with the users um, how um, and which were, were the things that really matters in doing tasks, daily living tasks. Second, working and seeing these activities uh, from side by side by the, the user, it really had, um, gave the, the designers to reveal the details, what really matters and which are the details. Also because if you just ask people or users to describe things, they just really are not able to, to, to show the details and just generalize stuff. But if you really work side by side with the user, you can really see the strategies also because uh, users or people with disability just can do thing or find found some strategies to do things in some different ways and so designers working side by side once again can highlight the all the the strategies that users use and then um, finally uh, designers can really uh, talk about the past experience of the user and here we can see also Another mm, great opportunity, which mm, which was gave by the competition, that was like um, putting this um, this closed on, which is really uh, had the possibility to highlight that we have to consider not only the grasp issues we saw all the, the competition, the tasks uh, that uh, the hand has to grasp something, but I'm dealing with the disability and mm, designing uh, an upper link prosthesis is not only a grasp issues, but it really has to deal with all the user system. And so just put on some clothes has, I mean, give, gave us some strength and constraints to, to face. And so you really have to mount in a usable manner all the user system. And once again, so 
uh, another great opportunity it's to highlight also the relation between the user system and all the environment this means that uh, in all the tasks we saw you have also to we had to also to consider the body posture for example or the relative position of the object with the with the user and also the conditions of the objects so if, where is the object and so on and this also was a great opportunity for the team to develop really um daily life activity that really are uh, real, I mean. And then also the, um, I mean, wearing also the prosthesis for uh, such a long time, such a long training or the competition uh, meant also for all our team to be uh, and to test it also in life situations. So in, in all these uh, poses and all this time we had to stay together, to live together, to share experiences. And this was another great opportunity and to see that that really gave us all the team all together to see which were or which could be also all the opportunities of the uh, processes uh, development in the future also. Because there is also this great paper that says that, okay, users could say what they need, but if you go down in observ observable and then tacit and then latent needs, you can really see and explore which are the the feelings and also the dreams and so really look at the future of the development of technology and not only at the present or a task a tangible task to 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 solve and oh this is a stupid video but i love it because it let i was trying to dance and to to sing but the end was a little bit too slow and I could not really control it from this arm position so it's, it was a a, a a pause moment but it really had the, the opportunity to highlight some little problems to be fixed in the control and in the end the design and also um, well the context uh, has as we saw um this is an old uh, framework from an architect that says that and if you put an an existing product in different contexts you're able to deconstruct all the uh, interaction and maybe to find something else such as new interactions and well the um the end uh, developed here in IIT and also in Università di Pisa um really showed how the its softness so the way it was it is designed is able also to push forward um social capabilities now here you can see in this in this video that with thanks to the softened uh, softness of the end i was uh, able to do this little joke of the bird <laughs> of the quiz uh, that the if the bird is alive or died and also in in interacting with uh, with other people uh, it really showed uh, his uh, great capabilities of being safe and uh, social social acceptable i would say well i would like to thank you and um, this is my email if you want to contact me and this last photo is me and Patricia when I met for the first time the soft end pro so thank you thank you very much Maria it was a super good presentation and not only from the from the subject point of view from the user but it's clearly very different perspective from a designer uh, demonstrating all the positive possibilities that the Cyberlon offers not only from the specific task but actually just by being together and doing different actions that are required during the normal uh, activities. So thanks for your for your input. And now we will move to the last speaker, which uh, who actually will we will uh, provide a bit of feedback more on the industrial perspective. 
Um, he is Roland Auberger. Um, he studied mechatronics at the Johannes Kepler University, Linz, um, and graduated in 2002. And then he continued his career as a research assistant at the Institute of uh, Robotics at the same university for some years. And then in 2004, he moved to the industry as a researcher and development uh, engineer at Autobot uh, Healthcare Products with multiple roles in the company. In the company. And during this period between 2015 and 2021, he actually did uh, or conducted his doctoral studies at the ATH Zurich uh, University in Switzerland, uh, specifically on the topic functional compensation of gait impairments with minimal actuation. He, of course, has strongly participated in the community with multiple publications and patents, but also he can show today a bit more uh, information from the industry point of view uh, on the use and abuse of supportive devices. So I think it will be the, the best uh, part, the best way to actually end up with this uh, webinar. So please, Ronald, whenever you want. I, I want to talk about uh, the abuse and use of supportive devices uh, from an industry uh, standpoint. Maria talked about human-centered design, and uh, that's that means we have to think a, a lot about uh, how users will use devices we design for them. But uh, that's a bit hard for us engineers because, as she also mentioned, we don't know. And uh, Otto Buck is a company that has been building prosthetic devices for decades. And I work for this company for more than a decade now. And I've seen quite a lot. And I want to share some experiences with you now. The probably most famous uh, product that comes from Otto Buck in Vienna is the Sealeg. It was launched in 1998. And recently, the, the latest generation was launched, it's called the Genium X4. And in the meantime, more than 100,000 microprocessor controlled knees have been produced and delivered. And uh, this number scale up because if you assume four years use time for each uh, leg, we have 400,000 years of use. And uh, yeah, you can do the math on the steps and kilometers, it's astronomic distances. And it's a lot of experience we gained. We saw a lot, uh, par partly also we got painful feedback, but uh, still we have a very successful product or, uh, even after 25 years. And our mission was always to build products that let the users forget their handicap. Uh, if we succeed in our mission, like we see here, this automatically always leads to challenges because uh, giving freedom back to the users, they will actually use it. Like this guy from Switzerland we see here, he likes to go to the mountains. Uh, Robert mentioned inclusion. So he, he wants to join his friends uh, walking to the mountains. And he found out, figured out ways to do it. And he doesn't care about the instruction of use for his prosthetic leg. And he doesn't know that there is a sensor in his ankle joint uh, that consists of very precise strain gauges and controls his knee joint. But this sensor was definitely not designed for putting or, 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 or uh, cutting uh, crampons into the ice. He doesn't care about this because uh, he, he wants to, uh, to to do what he whatever he needs to do uh, joining his friend in the mountains, and of course he had to get up he had to get down again. Fortunately, the world is not always that extreme like like in these pictures. There are all, but also simple choice of life like. Playing in the sandbox with your kids can be quite a challenge for, for your supportive devices. And even more, not only kids like to play in the sand. This guy, for example, uh, does not only expect his leg to survive his activities, he even more expected to perfectly support him all the time. 
he is fully concentrated on his game. He wants to get back on his feet uh, as soon as possible, be re being ready for the next ball. And he just relies on his on his leg that that, that this will work. At least he puts some protection over over the over the leg uh, prosthesis. But as an engineer, I wonder what the IMU signals that feed the controller would lo uh, would look like. Fortunately, uh, there is also a lot of normal use. But the field has become compet uh, competitive. So the marketing tries to uh, always push, push the limits and always advance further uh, when it comes to, to activities we want to make possible for our users. Because we need to differentiate. But in most of the cases, the world is not that extreme. There is a lot of regular use, like you see here in this picture. Uh, this guy is using a leg orthosis called the C brace, where I was involved in the development quite a bit. And uh, He also, partici he also participated in a study later on where we tried to figure out uh, how much and how he uses the, the devices. But let me uh, start with some basics first. Because when starting this project, we thought, let's just use CLEC technology and apply it or and orthotics and we're done. But soon enough, we figured out that the world is not that easy because prosthetics is a totally different field. In a prosthesis, you have a very well-defined situation. There is the ground reaction force uh, transmitted over the leg to the stump and from there to the body. In orthotics, there is the leg, uh, the residual limb of the user uh, in the middle of the structure as a parallel structure. The ground reaction force is transmitted to both things and the leg does, we don't know what the leg exactly does. Uh, this really depends on the residual functions of the user and if he has residual functions on the intention. So that makes control much more difficult. In prosthetics, there is a quite well-defined standard that tells you how you have to test your system with which loads to get to a certain work, uh, the weight class. In orthotics, the standard says that you have to test your system in an adequate way without any further details. And that's why we, we started a study uh, to figure out the real loads on such exoskeletal devices in lower extremity. And I want to share some uh, results with you. First thing we look at was the average daily use time. We had eight participants in our study. And, uh, and just uh, provided them uh, with a Seabrace systems that had an integrated data logger. So we could uh, monitor a lot of their motion and also uh, loads in the system. This box plot shows the daily use time over the whole study period and we see that it is on average 10 hours a day but still there are some users that use the device significantly longer which was a good sign for us uh, because that means the product works for him next big question was how many steps did they do on even terrain that's why we counted the uh, steps that had swing faces with more than uh, 20 degrees. And you see big variation uh, in the data here. We have uh, one big outlier that does way more steps than everybody else. Uh, who She was a very active person. And here we have the patient number three. He, she did, it looked like she did no steps at all. But uh, we figured out that this was not the case, as we, you would, uh, as you will see later. 
One of the reasons for this uh, deviations is also our uh, count counting method, because we only took uh, steps into account that had a swing phase angle of more than 20 degrees, because we wanted to learn about uh, the, the cycling numbers uh, of uh, high motion cycles. The Seabreeze is also capable of uh, walking down uh, ramps and stairs by flexing the knee and the load. And uh, this is what we also counted per day. And you see big variations here again. And very surprisingly, the patient number three is the outlier in the precise other direction. And the overlay from the last sh slide shows you why. This is the user uh, who had almost no steps in level walking, but he, she used the yielding functionality uh, during her regular steps. Please note that uh, the overlay has uh, a different scaling, which is indicated on the right side of the slide. But what about the loads? Uh, we were only, ta only talking about cyclists before. And this slide shows the maximum flexion load that occurred during the day. The gray shaded area gives a reference data from healthy individuals when walking downstairs. And what you could see here is that uh, the, these maximum load, loads are pretty much in the range of what uh, healthy people would uh, achieve. So this is an indicator that the Seabrace, at least for some users, does pretty much what, the, what uh, the muscles would do in healthy people. It does a little less for, for, for uh, the last few people who had a little better uh, residual muscle control. But it also tells us that, that uh, taking loads of, of, of healthy reference people as a reference is not a bad guess for the beginning. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little about unintended regular use. Uh, we all know it. You hit the corner of a table or you just uh, drop your device. That's why we also looked at the maximum accelerations that occurred during a day in our study. And we found out that very consistently people uh, uh, have shocks around 6G on average. And also very consistently, there are much higher shocks occasionally as outliers. And this is something that really has to be taken into account when, when designing for systems, because these, uh, when designing systems, because these shocks actually happen and they don't happen with some patients, they every now and then happen with virtually every patient. So in the next step, we looked a little closer into how these accelerations, where do they come from? So uh, I made these plots where uh, the, the main shock is at uh, point zero in time. And uh, we plotted a half a second before and half a second after the main impact. And you can see that the impact usually comes from different directions at the same time, which is a uh, strong indicator for a, for, a, uh, for a shock. And very interesting uh, are, is this data for patient six and patient seven, because you see two shocks in a very short period of time from different directions uh, following each other. And this looks very much like uh, the brace has fallen, bounced back and flipped around and, and, and fell on the other side. And if you ask people if they ever drop their devices, people usually don't admit it. But in our data, we see that this actually happens. And, uh, and this is something you have to take care of because, uh, yeah, the devices you build should survive the uh, everyday life of your users. And uh, these unintended, uh, unintended uh, shocks are def definitely part of it. Remember, these people have a handicap. They could also be uh, limited in their upper extremity dexterity. 
So this already brings me to my final concluding points. So if you're able to provide a supportive device that works really well for the patients, patient will actually use it and they will uh, come up with uh, functionalities and situations that you cannot take into account uh, in your design phase. Uh, people are very creative in this. The cycling numbers are quite high. So don't forget maintenance, both in your product design, uh, parts that, that might wear should be easy to change, but also if you start to, to uh, make a commercial product in your business case. And finally, a few words about standards. The standards only define necessary requirements that you have to meet to be able to, to market the product. If you have a pros uh, to have a successful product in the market, in my opinion, you have to, uh, to uh, be much, much better than the standards by far. For example, uh, the uh, minimum standard for ingress protection class uh, for home use devices is IP22, which is a little proof against uh, splash water and not dust proof at all. And just remember the slides at the beginning of my presentations and, and think about how far you would get with your product if, if it was not waterproof and not dust proof at all. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. And yeah, I'm open for questions in the panel discussion afterwards. Thank you so much, Roland. Very interesting perspective also from uh, the industry and the actual translation and use of products in, uh, in real life. So thank you for these uh, insights. And now we can uh, move to the final part of this webinar. So with a panel discussion, um, we would like to open the discussion with one uh, question related also to uh, what Roland was mentioning, so about more translating this to real world application. So the first question that we thought was uh, how translatable is Cybertron to real use of technology? So uh, especially looking at your experience uh, in the contest, in the competition and your different perspective uh, ranging from users, designer, um, industry, research. So what's your uh, opinion? And of course, Robert, your uh, opinion as uh, uh, the main initiator of the um, of the of the cyberdrone. Maybe we can start with Yorn, if it's okay for you, since you also you mentioned all the path uh, looking at your uh, research background, and uh, you mentioned also quickly how cyberdrone helped you to see some challenges that are more close to uh, real world application uh, and how to deal with this in your uh, research context. Um, yeah, I can uh, give a few comments about that. So I think, um, well, it, it helps because it forces you to get out of the lab and uh, yeah, moving with the robot with perception and everything out of the lab uh, is a, a tricky um, story. And I'm, well, yeah, we will see how, how this works in the end because it's the first time that uh, that we participate in uh, in Cyberlon sense. The discipline is new. We, we have some experience, of course, with out of the house demos. <laughs> Uh, so we we are positive <laughs> that this will work out, but we will definitely learn some new things there. Uh, uh, so in that regard, I think it, it helps translating. I mean, what is what is tricky, of course, since it is a challenge and time plays a role. One also optimizes a bit for this challenge, and uh, yeah, one has to, I guess, find a good balance between um, yeah, really optimizing to the point where it's only applicable to the uh, to the tasks that one has to do in Cybertron. Uh, but with some variation in the tasks and uh, I think also with, with some involvement of, uh, we have to see how this discipline uh, works in this first edition, but with the involvement, this will definitely help in translating in the future. Um, and well, hopefully also uh, give more, um, or give a stage to this technology. I mean, uh, we now have six teams in this discipline, uh, which is uh, more than I initially expected, I have to admit, but this is great that, that so many teams uh, find their way to participate in this. Okay. And uh, Roland, from the uh, industry point of view, what do you feel like the, how Cyberdrone is pushing this 
the translation to real world application? Yeah. I think that this is a, a could be like a launch pad for for many uh, for many concepts because uh, as uh, mentioned before, uh, Jörn uh, mentioned it. Uh, you are forced to work with with your uh, with your customers or with your patients, and they teach you such a big lot. And Jörn also mentioned, yeah, you have the tendency to optimize. But he gets aware of it. He, uh, you know, you, you get this awareness. Uh, yeah, there is this task X. I, I try to optimize for this, but it costs me, I don't know, five hours to get it done properly. Is this realistic in real world? No, it isn't, uh, unless it's a really very necessary task you have to, to, to really do uh, every day. But, 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 but to get this, this view for the variations and, and, and to find out the small challenges in life, that, that, that's, I think... Uh, a huge value and the other thing is the social aspect it's it's uh, you work with the patients you 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 talk to the patients and and, and all these uh, what maria mentioned uh, this team aspect uh, i think this creates a lot of value and and also uh, many of these uh, yeah all, all this value sooner or later will translate it to product because because everybody who is involved there learns a lot and and, and if it starts working later on on real product design, then this knowledge is with him forever, and that that's a huge value, and it's relevant tasks. That's absolutely a great point. I would like to hear also the opinion of Maria. Uh, Regarding the yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, Jorn said it forced people to go um, outside the lab. And I would like to say it forced users to go in the lab. Because as I tried to, to say that for me, well, we, we, we three knows it very well, that sometimes during the training, I said, I find myself saying, oh, no, 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 this is impossible. No, no, we can do that. And But there, with the technology, with the device, in the end, you just try to do it. So it really uh, push also users to go in the lab. So it's it works both sides. And Robert, you had this in mind when you designed the Cybertron, also the, this perspective of bringing the users in the lab. Yes, it was exactly the goal that we support and promote a user-oriented design. It was a goal that we um, set up tracks which are close to daily life scenarios. Um, that's, of course, not a real, real scenario. We have to design it in a way that it's comparable and that all teams have the same chances and have some chances. But it not, it's not like the Paralympics where it's just to lift the weight or to jump long and run fast. Um, it's really uh, the goal to um, train things which are relevant for daily life. And we kind of force the teams to have to nominate the pilot very early to meet and to design the things together. Yeah, very interesting point. I want to, I have also another curiosity that I wanted to, to address with all of you, which is that for those that know Cybertron for many years, uh, every time that Cybertron has taken place, it's always evolving. Task has changed every time, new modalities, new technology requirements also appear. Um, but of course, uh, research is also evolving pretty, pretty fast, uh, proposing new, no, uh, novel solutions that sometimes they are not ready still to address these very extreme challenges. So how do you envision or how do you see Cybertron uh, helping in this adapting or fast adapting uh, challenge or like environment? I, I can shortly start. Um, yeah. um, we are well aware that the technology gets better and better and that's why the tasks also get more and more difficult. For example, the steps at the wheelchair race. At the first event eight, eight years ago, it was just three steps to go over with a wheelchair. Not all teams could do it, but many. Then uh, four years later, it was a seven step staircase and now it's a for this year it's a curved step 
So uh, in this way, we try to adapt the difficulty level to the advancement in the technology. However, it's also a challenge because we might exclude none now the newer teams or those teams which are not that well advanced. And that's a challenge for us. Yeah, you're right. Maybe Jorn, you can also speak about your experience because new modality probably first, uh, as Robert mentioned, you know, like just the first step of the of this specific technology. But then maybe in the next session it would be much more complex. So how do you see yourself even uh, improving more the technology to address this? Um, yeah, I'm, I mean it's 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 tricky. I thought myself, what uh, these ten tasks that we have now um, would I change any of these? Or I guess we, I mean. Since uh, robotics will uh, also progress in the next four years, uh, I guess yeah we will have we will see different tasks in the in the addition in four years. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a small or it's it's a tough decision how to design those tasks to um, yeah to ha have it achievable or at the border of achievable. I think that's the the aim. If we have ten tasks in ten minutes, which is uh, very tricky. Uh, let's see if uh, if we can can manage. Uh, given this time limit, um, but yeah, it's 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 a big challenge, and I'm I'm looking forward. Maybe we can also, or we will also, as I said, we it's great to build a community around this event. So I guess uh, at some point it would also be good to gather the experience from the teams now after this first edition and, and see how to evolve the task and where to what to aim for to uh, yeah keep this challenge up to date uh, with what's going on in robotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Maria, maybe from your user point of view or pilot in this case, no? How do you yes well these uh, problematics? Well the only thing I noticed is that uh if you have a competition there will be teams <clears throat> that try to uh, design devices to win the competition. So uh thing it's to design a device to win a competition another thing it's to design a device for really help people with disability in real life. So, but I always see uh, so the the rules of the cybertron to stay really, um, really in this way because I try to to show it that it, there was some a task that you have to put on the sweater. This means that the device has to go inside this weather and to really to work good also with the with the this piece of clothes. This means real life. So uh, I always uh, have seen also Cybertron trying to to keep really the attention up about the, all the this kind of stuff. Yeah, and I want to also see a bit the point of uh, Roland because I something that you mentioned also in your presentation was this flexibility. And as Maria pointed out, sometimes competitions can be very specific because of the rules. Of course, you need to keep everyone on doing similar stuff in order to be able to compare performance. But from your point of view, you mentioned that the flexibility is actually something that actually push in the case of Autobook um, the way to to design systems in in a much more robust manner. No, so. Do you think this flexibility is an aspect that could be somehow at some point also included in the competition uh, on the event itself, or it's not necessary at this point? I totally agree with uh, what Maria said, that people try to uh, train for the competition and the tasks, but the nice thing is with every Cybertron, the tasks change. And I'm not worried that we will run out of tasks in the future. So, so we can keep this ecosystem alive uh, for a very, very long time for the benefit of the patients because it's the small things you have in mind. Yeah, it, it, uh, like, like Maria said, putting on a pullover, uh, not getting stuck in there. There could be, uh, if, you are, if you are nasty, you could make it from a ele very electrostatic material that could kill your electronics if you didn't design that properly. But that's, again, in <laughs> industry perspective. But this is... What happens in real life many times if you uh, and what you have to to take into account uh, but yeah I think that that uh, the tasks at, uh, at the cyber plan are relevant and uh, they will stay relevant like they get harder and harder with time uh, people evolve uh, I also see this little aspect uh, Robert mentioned that newbie teams will have a disadvantage with very complex tasks, but but uh, yeah, 
on the other hand, maybe they come up with a totally different technology and, 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 and can succeed because at the end of the day, we all do it for the end users. We don't do it for, for us. We don't do it maybe a little bit for fun, but, 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 but the main vision should be the end user and, the user and, and, and designing useful devices and not starting from scratch all over again every time. So I like the evolution aspect of it. Perfect. And we are looking forward to see the next editions of Cyberdon as well and see how this will evolve and how the technology, of course, will evolve accordingly. So I think with this, uh, we conclude uh, our uh, webinar today. So once again, thanks to everyone for participating. Unfortunately, we uh, didn't end the discussion, including the audience, but I'm pretty sure people will uh, reach out for more questions after watching uh, uh, offline. Thanks a lot, Claudio, also for uh, initiating uh, this uh, and supporting. As that. usual, and <clears throat> to all people that watch this film, watch out for the fifth webinar, which we're already planning. It will happen somewhere between November and December this year. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.